Welcome back to this series on neural network programming. In this video, we'll learn about reduction operations for tensors. We'll focus in on the frequently used argmax function, and we'll see how to access the data inside our tensors. Without further ado, let's get started. Let's kick things off by giving a definition for a reduction operation. A reduction operation on a tensor is an operation that reduces the number of elements contained within the tensor. So far in this series, we've learned that tensors are the data structures of deep learning. And as such, our first task is to load our data elements into a tensor. For this reason, tensors are super important, but ultimately what we are doing with the tensor operations we've been learning about in this series is managing our data elements contained within our tensors. Tensors give us the ability to manage our data. Data structures in general do this. Data structures provide the necessary structure for performing data management tasks like computations, storage, access, etc. Reshaping operations give us the ability to position our elements along particular axes. Element-wise operations allow us to perform operations on elements between two tensors and reduction operations allow us to perform operations on elements within a single tensor. Let's look at an example now in code. Suppose we have the following 3x3 three three rank 2 tensor. Let's look at our first reduction operation, a summation. Focus on the code and then we'll break it down. In the first cell, we take the sum of our tensor's scalar components using the sum tensor method. The result of this call is a scalar value tensor. Checking the number of elements in the original tensor against the result of the sum method call, we can see that indeed the tensor returned by the call to sum contains fewer elements than the original. Since a number of elements have been reduced by the operation, we can conclude that this sum operation is a reduction operation. So that's our first example of a reduction operation. Let's look at some other common ones. Check it out. All of these tensor methods reduce the tensor to a single element scalar value tensor by operating on all the tensor's elements. Reduction operations in general allow us to compute aggregate total values across data structures. Here's a question though. Do reduction operations always reduce to a tensor with a single element? The answer to this question is no. In fact, we often reduce specific axes at a time, and this usually leads to a reduction output that has multiple elements. To reduce a tensor with respect to a specific axis, we use the same methods and we just pass a value for the dimension parameter. This is a three by four rank two tensor. Having different links for the two axes here will help us understand these reduction operations. Let's consider the sum method again, only this time we'll specify a dimension to reduce. We have two axes, so we'll do both of them. Check it out. Thinking back to when I first learned this, I was pretty confused when I saw these results. If you're confused like I was, I highly recommend you pause the video and try to understand what's happening here. Remember, we are reducing this tensor with respect to an axis, and elements running along the first axis are arrays, and the elements running along the second axis are numbers. Have a look at this clip to get an idea about what we need. Pay close attention to the wording. Georgie. Oh, well, I'm element wise, the dancing clown. <laughs> element wise, yes, meet Georgie. Georgie, meet element wise. <laughs> no, we aren't strangers, are we? <laughs> okay, so if you don't know, that is a movie called It, 
and that clown lives in the sewer and its actual name is Pennywise. But for our purposes, we care about element wise operations. When we take the summation with respect to the first axis, we are summing the elements of the first axis. It's like this. And as we learned from element wise, the clown, element wise operations are in play here. When we sum across the first axis, we are taking the summation of all the elements of the first axis. To do this, we must utilize element wise addition. This is why we covered element wise operations before reduction operations in the series. If you haven't seen the video on element wise operations, I highly recommend you check it out. The second axis in the tensor contains numbers that come in groups of four, one for each element of the first axis. Since we have three groups of four numbers, we get three sums. This may take some time to sink in. Don't worry, you can do it. It just takes some time and repetition. Now with this heavy lifting out of the way, let's look at a very common reduction operation used in neural network programming called argmax. Argmax is a mathematical function that tells us which argument, when supplied to a function as input, results in the function's max output value. So argmax tells us the index location of the maximum value inside a tensor. When we call the argmax method on a tensor, the tensor is reduced to a new tensor that contains a single index value indicating where the max value is inside the tensor. Let's see this in code. In this tensor, we can see that the max value is the five in the last position of the last array. Suppose we are tensor walkers. To arrive at this element, we walk down the first axis until we reach the last array element. And then we walk down to the end of this array, passing by the four and the two zeros to arrive at the five. Let's look at some code. The first piece of code confirms for us that the max is indeed five, but the call to the argmax method tells us that the five is sitting at index 11. This seems a little strange. What's happening here? Well, have a look at the flattened output for this tensor. If we don't specify an axis for the argmax method, it returns the index location of the max value from the flattened tensor, which in this case is indeed 11. All right, so let's see what it takes to work with specific axes. We're working with both axes of this tensor in this code. Notice how the call to the max method returns two tensors. The first tensor contains the max values and the second tensor contains the index locations for these max values. The second tensor is what we get when we call the argmax method. For the first axis, the max values are four, three, three, and five. These values are determined by taking the element wise maximum across each array running along the first axis. For each of these maximum values, the argmax method tells us where each of these elements along the first axis lives in terms of its index. The four, lives at index two of the first axis. The three lives at index one of the first axis. The second three lives at index one of the first axis. And the five lives at index two of the first axis. For the second axis, the max values are two, three, and five. These values are determined by taking the maximum inside each array of the first axis. We have three groups of four, which gives us three maximum values for each array. The argmax values tell us the index inside each respective array where the max value lives. In practice, we often use the argmax function on a neural network's output prediction tensor. This allows us to determine which category has the highest prediction value. And this is because each index of the output tensor typically corresponds to a particular prediction category or prediction class. 
Let's look at access now. Suppose we have the following tensor. Check out these operations on this one. When we call the mean on the 3x3 tensor, the reduced output is a scalar value tensor. If we want to actually get the value as a number, we can do it using the item tensor method. The item tensor method only works with scalar value tensors. Have a look at how we can access multiple values within a tensor. When we compute the mean across the first axis, multiple values are returned, and we can access these numeric values by transforming the output tensor into a Python list or into a NumPy array. All of these tensor topics are pretty raw and rough to get through. However, I think there's a fundamental truth. We've got to, we've got to step up our game, mate. If you're going to be like a professional, yo. <laughs> You gotta step up your game! <laughs> Congrats for making it this far in the series. We're ready to start part two of the series now, where we'll put all of the knowledge we've learned about tensors to use. We'll be kicking things off by learning about the data set we'll be training on, the Fashion MNIST data set. Until then, hit the like button and share this video so we can build collective intelligence that makes the world a better place. If you haven't already, check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Congrats again on your progress, and I'll see you in the next one. I'm going to talk today about machines. And in fact, in particular, I'm going to talk about two machines, computers and people. The notion here is that um, I'm really going to talk, be talking about what we are um, from the perspective in many ways of, uh, of what we are now doing with computation. Um, there is something, there's something called uh, survivor's bias. Uh, and that is uh, when you take a look at the people who do really well, you ask what features actually are associated with them doing really well. And many of them will say intuition. Of course, intuition is also a feature that's associated with people doing badly. Uh, that is making guesses. Turns out that smart people make really good guesses, um, and um, not so smart people make bad guesses. But it all comes down to, it all comes down to coming to a decision, coming to an understanding of what's happening in the world, assessing what's happening without knowing why. Uh, and we look at the machine and we think, well, machines don't do that. They're all based on rules. But that's not the case. Um, machines are already incredibly intuitive. Um, I mean, astoundingly intuitive, um, which is to say a lot of the work that you're seeing nowadays in the world of what's called uh, deep learning is all about building up a machine's intuition. That is giving a machine an example after an example after an example and having it slowly learn from all those examples until it hits the point where it can look at a new situation and say, I know what's going on here and come up with an answer.